Well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back, and thanks for coming. Uh, this is the third of my broad overview lectures about epidemiology and its, and its relevance for this course on quantitative methods. If you remember last time, we talked about the Framingham Heart Study when we were discussing the development of the epidemiologic method over time. What I'd like to do now is just describe, in some sense, what the Framingham Study uh, is, what it has given to us. So first of all, this study started in 1948. Uh, at that time, Framingham, Massachusetts, which is located about 10 miles west of here in Boston, in some sense was a typical American town. It had some urban aspects to it, some rural aspects to it. It had been involved in previous study, I believe, involving a tuberculosis study. So the people were, were willing to be interviewed and be involved in, in, in research studies. So at that time, investigators wanted to, uh, to answer the question, what are the risk factors for developing cardiovascular disease, stroke and heart disease, in other words? So the main goal of this study was to identify the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So in 1948, Framingham enrolled 5,209 men and women aged 30 to 62 living in the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. Why do you think they enroll people between the ages of 30 and 62? Why not enroll anybody under 30, 25 year olds? Why not enroll anybody older than 62, 70 year olds? Well, we epidemiologists have a dark side. We want to observe disease outcomes occurring among people. The plan for the Framingham Heart Study was to enroll people in 1948, follow them for 20 years and see who develops heart disease, who develops stroke. Well, 20 years is a long time to follow people. And if you're going to follow people for 20 years as an epidemiologist, you're hoping to observe cases of stroke, cases of heart disease occurring from these people. The reason they didn't enroll any 20-year-olds is because they thought they were relatively fit, unlikely to develop heart disease for the next 20 years, unlikely to develop stroke for the next 20 years. Enrolling such people would be very inefficient. And that's why they decided to enroll people who were at least 30 years of age. But if that logic is true, why didn't they enroll any 70-year-olds or 80-year-old people? Remember, they only enrolled people up to the age of 62. If I enroll 70-year-old people, I'd expect more of them to develop heart disease or stroke than 40, 50, 30-year-old people. Well, my understanding is the reason they didn't enroll 65-year-olds or 70-year-olds or 80-year-olds was because at that time, they thought anybody of that age had already developed signs and symptoms of heart disease, hardening of the arteries, as it was referred, atherosclerosis. So they wanted to enroll people free of the disease to see the development of disease among those people over the next 20 years of follow-up. And if people already had that disease at 1948, there's no reason to enroll them in that study because they're not going to be able to be useful to answer the question, what are the risk factors for causing that disease if, in fact, they already have it? So they enrolled people 30 to 62 years old. They were free of, court, of cardiovascular disease and any symptoms of cardiovascular disease. And the plan was to follow them for 20 years and record these outcomes, the development of stroke, the development of hypertension, the development of, cardi of coronary heart disease. Well, how do they record these outcomes? Well, every two years, participants are asked to return to a testing center where they are examined. Their histories are recorded, their risk factors are updated, their outcomes are updated. They are asked, since the last time we saw you, has anyone told you that you've developed a heart attack or a stroke? They'll measure their blood pressure to see if it, they now have been uh, high blood pressure, falling into a category of hypertension. So the ways to measure those outcomes was by personal testing, personal interview. A very expensive way to do it, and what I'd like you to think about is what alternatives might there be to record that information. In a few weeks, we'll be talking about cohort studies, and this is the classic example of a cohort study. Enrolling a group of people free of disease and following them for, in this case, 20 years to see who develops the disease. The question as an epidemiologist is how are you going to measure those outcomes? And how are you going to measure them validly and efficiently? In this case, they decided to measure them validly by interviewing people, examining people. But that brings a cost. 
a cost of bringing people into a testing center, having a staff to test them. And one of the things I'd like you to think about is if you could redesign the Framingham Heart Study today, is there another way you can measure those outcomes at a lower cost? And we'll talk about that in a few weeks when we talk about study designs, cohort studies, and other types of, of epidemiologic studies. But that's the, the original plan of the Framingham Heart Study. Just as an aside, it was planned to go for 20 years. It's still going on today. People who are alive from that original cohort of 5,209 people are still coming back every two years to be examined. But as you might guess, unfortunately, many of those people in the original cohort have passed on. And the, the number of survivors is dwindling year to year. Well, there have been other studies built on the Framingham original cohort. 20 years after, about 23 years after the original cohort was started, they started a second cohort study of 5,124 other people who were the children, the offsprings of those initial people in the initial cohort study, along with their spouses. As the town of Framingham evolved over time and due to people moving in and out, took on a different flavor in terms of its, of its racial ethnic background, in 1994 they took another 506 people somewhat randomly selected from that town as the first Omni study. In the early part of this century, they took a third study, a cohort of the offsprings of the offsprings, the, the grandchildren of the original cohort, along with their spouses. By taking the second and third generation of the original cohort, they were able to do family history studies. Uh, and that's an advantage of this type of study design. And then more recently, they did a second uh, Omni study, a second sample of the, of, the, uh, of the town of Framingham, Massachusetts. Now, what have they discovered? You can go to their webpage, and I strongly recommend you do go to their webpage, and you'll find a, a, a huge amount of information, both about the history of the study and their findings. Among their major findings, their milestones, smoking, not surprisingly, is a risk factor for heart disease. So why don't you smoke? Why is smoking now considered a, a bad habit? It's because the Framingham Heart Study and other studies, other epidemiology studies, showed a link between smoking and the development of coronary heart disease. They were the ones who showed relationships between blood pressure and cholesterol, total cholesterol as risk factors for increasing your risk of heart disease. They showed that physical activity was good for you. It lowers your risk of heart disease. They showed the components of total cholesterol, HDL and LDL, the good cholesterol, the HDL, high levels that actually decrease your risk of heart disease. They develop prediction rules. You can go to their website, and we will later on in this course. And you can predict your risk of developing a heart attack in the next 10 years by plugging in your values for certain risk factors. So remember in the first um, um, lecture, I mentioned clinical epidemiology and the role of prediction, the role of predicting uh, either prognostic or diagnostic information from risk factors. We'll be talking about that using the Framingham model and the Framingham data. And they have many, many more results that you can see on their web page. So the Framingham study is a landmark study, a classic example of epidemiologic study. And it's something we'll be referring to a lot in this class. So for this course, we're going to be using data furnished by the National Hot Lung and Blood Institute. It's going to be based on the Framingham Heart Study. It's going to be available to you to use in, our, in your exercises. We'll be using it in our lectures. In a future uh, lecture, one of my colleagues will be telling you about the data set in more detail, and she will be telling you how to access that data set, giving the link that you'll be using for your, for your homework exercises. You can get access to two teaching data sets. One of those da teaching data sets is based on the Framingham Heart Study, and we're going to be using that data set in this course. That particular data set is based on the original Framingham data, but it has been perturbed, slightly changed, to protect the, the identity of the original cohort. We're going to have 4,434 people from the original 5,209. Some of their information has been altered, but the general associations that we would see in the original data are going to uh, be seen in these data also. We will use these data in our lectures you will be using these data in your exercises. One of the advantages of taking this course, as you will see, is we have access to a software package called Stata. We have access to this teaching data set. 
you yourselves on your computers will be essentially analyzing this teaching data set using Stata. The data that is in this teaching data set is essentially three exam cycles from the original Framingham cohort. The 1956 exam, where people were returning for their third or fourth follow-up exam, and at that examination certain risk factors were obtained, and two follow-up exams, roughly six years apart, one which was around the 1962 period and one around the 1968 period. In addition to that, everyone was followed for 24 years. So we have 24 years of potential follow-up for each of these 4,434 people. And what were recorded from these biennial examinations they went to every two years is certain outcomes. So among the outcomes we're going to be able to look at and among the risk factors we'll be able to link to those outcomes are the following. This is essentially a very brief overview of the data set itself. So what we have are three exam cycles showing the age of each person at that exam, their sex, whether they were a smoker or not, and how much they smoked in terms of cigarettes per day, their blood pressure both on the systolic and the diastolic scale, whether they were taking medications to treat hypertension at that time, their co total cholesterol levels and their HDL and LDL levels in addition, whether they had diabetes diagnosed at that particular time at that particular examination, their glucose levels, their heart rate, and whether they had previously been diagnosed with coronary heart disease, whether they had a history of heart disease, a history of stroke, or a history of hypertension. Those are all the risk factors that we'll be looking at. In terms of the outcomes, remember everyone was followed for up to 24 years. We're going to know whether a person died or didn't die during those 24 years whether there's evidence that they developed coronary heart disease, evidence that they developed stroke, evidence that developed other outcomes like hypertension, and we'll also have the number of years from the 1956 exam until they died or developed a stroke or developed heart disease or developed hypertension. We'll be using these data in our lectures. You'll be using these data in your homework exercises. So together, we'll be, get, we'll be, getting, we'll be getting very familiar with the Framingham data and very familiar with the Framingham Heart Study. Well, that's where we're heading. I'm going to stop now, and the next time you'll see me, I'll be talking about measuring outcomes. I'll be talking about measuring the prevalence of disease, and then later the incidence of disease. After that, we'll be measuring associations between risk factors and outcomes, and then we're going to go more into the study design options. But before we do that, you want to develop a foundation in biostatistics, and that's what my colleague Marcello Pagano will be doing. So I'm going to be stopping now. You'll see me again probably next week. But in the interim, you're going to be exposed to Marcello a lot, and he's going to be teaching you the fundamentals of biostatistics along the way. So see you guys in about a week.